The following contains bright colours and flashing lights, animated violence and gore, animated and drawn nudity, discussion of traumatic brain injuries in fictional contexts, and brief references to child abuse, self-harm, and suicide. Viewer discretion is advised. G'day web surfers, I'm Cowboy, and today I wanted to discuss my thoughts and theories on the infamous retro-styled horror game Power Drill Massacre. This game was released as a demo in 2015 by Puppet Combo and quickly gained notoriety for its uncanny ability to evoke dread, hopelessness and utter panic, despite its simplistic plot and graphics. As with many horror stories, one of the factors behind its horrifying atmosphere is how it plays into our instinctive fear of the unknown. That which we don't understand feels outside of our control, reminding us of our fallibility, mortality and insignificance compared to the rest of the universe. Perhaps the game's biggest mystery is the fate of its protagonist, Megan Brook, specifically in the quote-unquote true ending. After collecting three keys throughout the warehouse while eluding the driller killer, Megan unlocks the door to a seemingly endless hallway. There she's beckoned onwards by the sight of a little girl and the prospect of escaping. This girl waits for Megan next to a doorway glowing red, out of which the driller killer emerges. Megan runs past him and is relentlessly pursued as the hallway transitions from blood red to blinding white. A radio announcement later reveals that while her boyfriend's body was found along with their car, Megan herself is still unaccounted for. The sound of a music box, drilling, and torturous screams echo into the night, bringing this story to an ambiguous close. Did Megan escape? Did she eventually get caught, tortured and murdered by the driller killer? Or did something else happen? Just as the unknown provokes fear in many of us, rationalizing available information can help us regain some semblance of power and control. And so to quell the quiver of my heart from this game, I'm going to be investigating its events and outcome. Full disclosure beforehand, the following is just my own interpretation of the evidence currently available, and I do not claim any of my opinions to be irrefutable fact or canon. I welcome debates in the comments, but please keep it civil. I will not facilitate any hostility or harassment on my channel. With all that being said, let's see if we can find some answers to Megan's fate. To start with, I don't believe the screams were intended to imply Megan's demise. This ending was added after the original, which featured her, caged and stripped naked, meeting her doom at the drill of her captor. Not to mention her death from getting hit too many times while the player has control is quite graphic as well. In fact, unabashed gory violence has always been one of Puppet Combo's pivotal features. After all, many of their works pay homage to classic slashes like Halloween and Friday the 13th. Therefore, it seems unlikely that they're just censoring Megan's death for being too brutal in this version of events. What's more significant is that the screams don't match Megan's voice. She always screams and cries in a high-pitched tone. speculated by some that Megan's vocal cords could have been damaged by torture and excessive screaming, but personally, I find that this relies too much on guesswork without much concrete in-game evidence. On the other hand, comparing the screams with the driller killer's vocalizing in the bad end shows them to be strikingly similar. <laughs> <laughs> 
Players who turn the camera to face the driller killer showed that as long as the player keeps running, he will remain several paces behind Megan for the entire length of the hallway. He does not gain speed or show any indication of catching up to her at all. It doesn't seem like Poppet Combo didn't want people to see the Driller Killer running behind Megan, since they give players two camera options, one of which lets them move the camera freely. Therefore, it seems that the Driller Killer wasn't able to keep up with Megan despite her injuries. From what we can tell, he usually opts for stealth and ambush when stalking his victims, so perhaps he's not used to chasing them down like this and consequently has limited endurance for such tasks. He could be tired from a recent kill, as suggested by Richard the Hanging Man. Or maybe Megan's just a good long distance runner, whether professionally or for casual exercise. Either way, it appears that the same endurance which helps Megan lose her pursuer in the warehouse is her saving grace in this scene as well. Given that the radio announcement references Security Council Resolution 598, which happened in late July 1987, and Megan and Jeff are said to have been missing since May, there is approximately two months between their accident and the radio announcement. This begs the question of what Megan did during that time and why she still hasn't been found several weeks later. I will explore this further later in the video, but it's not implausible for someone to be missing for months or even years before being found again, especially in a place as remote as the Pocono Mountains and its surrounding wilderness. It's possible she fled further into the wilderness, away from Route 447, which she and Jeff came from, making it harder for rescuers to find her. Considering all this, the Driller Killer being the one to scream in the true ending seems to be the most logical explanation. Why exactly he's screaming is unclear, however, some say it's because he's furious Megan escaped his clutches, and that the drilling sounds are him self-harming as a result. Given his mental state, as indicated by his overall behaviour, this feels plausible. Adding such a drawn out, inconclusive scene if the outcome's meant to still be the same feels redundant. Not giving any indication that the method of murder was at least a bit different in this scenario adds to that sense of disappointment. Especially after the player's presumable frustration of even trying to survive long enough to trigger this ending. Despite the gravity of her situation, I'm optimistic that Megan ultimately survived. So now that we've got a plausible outcome to the true ending, what happened in the lead up to Megan's escape and the Driller Killer's self-destruction? Many have turned to supernatural explanations for the hallway scene. These theories do hold weight, given the satanic themes and elements shown in other puppet combo games, as well as the upside down pentagram painted on a shed and the ghost-like figures seen in PDM itself. However, the minimalism of the current demo version allows for interpretations more and grounded in reality. Not to mention, as a practicing witch myself, I'd rather steer away from tropes which continue to stigmatize pagans and magical practitioners, thank you very much. <laughs> Instead, I want to explore an aspect of PDM which is almost always overlooked by players and theorists. After climbing out of the wrecked car, Megan comments that she has the worst headache ever. Many consider this a throwaway line with no further relevance, however I argue that it could actually be one of the most important lines of the entire demo. This line implies that Megan hit her head during the crash, most likely from falling headfirst into the dashboard in front of her when the car slammed to a halt. As a result, she probably sustained some sort of traumatic brain injury, or TBI for short. Based on the fact that Megan rubs her forehead during her idol animation, the TBI most likely affected her frontal lobe and possibly temporal lobe, which are located towards the front of the brain. I'm not a medical expert by any means, so this theory is only based on what's shown in-game and layman information regarding TBI signs and symptoms I was able to find. Fictional stories, including horror-themed ones, often take creative liberties and require some suspension of disbelief in order to convey the intended emotions and messages. 
So if Papa Combo had intended to show Megan with a TBI, this could explain its potentially less than accurate depiction. For the sake of this theory, it's important to remember that even a mild concussion counts as a TBI, and therefore most of the signs and symptoms I will be discussing can apply regardless of the TBI's level of severity and classification. With that being said, let's delve further into this hypothetical scenario. Following a TBI, it is highly encouraged to avoid physical exertion which could aggravate the injury and increase the damage caused. Consequently, Megan trekking up the mountain and exploring the warehouse while being chased likely worsened her TBI, potentially explaining the unusual phenomena she experiences. It is shown that Megan displays a number of characteristics which could be interpreted as signs and symptoms of a TBI. Firstly, her idle animation shows her being rather unsteady on her feet, swaying from side to side in a continuous fashion. Not to mention, as many players have noted, her controls are particularly janky. Dizziness and uncoordinated movements can indicate damage to parts of the brain responsible for controlling gross motor movements such as standing and running. What's fascinating about PDM in contrast to other Puppet Combo games is that Megan has no option to hide or fight back against her attacker. All she can do is hope to outmaneuver him. Perhaps constantly lashing out and diving for cover would have been straining her body too far in her weakened state. It should be noted that the Driller Killer also has swaying as his idle animation. Each character could have their own in-game reasons for moving in such a manner, although Puppet Combo often give their character models the same idle animation whether to save time and effort or to emulate the technologically limited retro games they take inspiration from. Therefore, it's any guess what implications this has on the theory. Blurry vision is another prominent symptom seen in TBIs. While the game's field of vision is in third person, so we can't determine how Megan visually perceives the world, the gradual loss of finer details in the hallway scene could represent this. Even the grammatical errors seen in her dialogue and while reading articles could also point towards this. They do start showing up when she's hiked up the mountain and started exerting herself after all. This would correlate with other signs of TBI which include reading and speaking difficulties. In particular, this could explain a notable discrepancy between the date of the radio announcement and a wanted poster's date of October of the same year. Again, this could just be mistakes on Puppet Combo's part, but if you're looking for an in-universe reason, this could be a plausible presumption. Struggle or loss of cognitive ability can also indicate a TBI. Cognition relates to intellectual processes like attention to details, evaluation, and problem solving. Megan remains insistent on finding a phone to call for help for her boyfriend Jeff, despite the grave danger she herself is in. And as previously mentioned, she never seems to consider hiding or fighting back to survive her ordeal. Perhaps her damaged cognitive faculties, as well as sheer panic, meant she wasn't in a frame of mind to act rationally throughout the game. Another distinction from other Poppet Combo protagonists is that Megan does not solve a myriad of puzzles to escape. Her survival is entirely dependent on a single door with three coloured locks and if she's lucky enough to find them before the Driller Killer finds her. It would be unimaginably hard for Megan to solve so many puzzles in her condition. So perhaps the basic premise of the demo version was intentional, or at least appropriate given her circumstances. Lastly, damage to the brain can cause hallucinations to form. Hallucinations can affect all five senses, especially sight and sound in a variety of ways. Depending on the specific location of the TBI, even concussions can cause people to experience them. Many believe the hallway scene is symbolic of Megan's transition to the afterlife, with red representing her death and white representing her ascension to heaven. Again, this is a valid theory, although I have another idea on what this all means. 
If we were to assume no supernatural forces are at work in PDM's context, all the unusual occurrences in it can be explained by hallucinations. Random noises such as footsteps, shuffling, voices and screaming with no apparent source can be heard. Some of these sounds are of course real, but others play when there's no one else around. This could indicate that at least some of the noises heard are actually auditory hallucinations, owing to Megan's TBI and growing paranoia. After reading about Christine Wilbur, a little girl implied to have been abducted and murdered by the Driller Killer, Megan's brain may have conjured up a guess as to what Christine looked like. Alternatively, if she's encountered before Megan reads that article, the hallucination could be based on a random child from her past, maybe even her own childhood appearance. Either way, Megan's brain tricking her into seeing a child might be its way of conveying her desire for comfort, as one might assume that a place with kids running around is quite safe. The adult figures seen above the stairs to the warehouse and in the warehouse's corridors could also be hallucinations, induced by the exertion of climbing up the mountain and being chased. Again, these illusions could reflect her desperation for someone to help her, and the hope that others have survived the Driller Killer, so she might have a chance as well. These types of hallucinations would be considered psychodynamic in nature. And while not all hallucinations follow this Freudian concept, studies have shown that psychodynamics can be a factor. These types of hallucinations are an absolute favourite of medically inexperienced story writers, since they serve to expose the character's deepest thoughts and flaws. While some of her hallucinations serve to project her subconscious desires, others are seemingly random. Flashes of drawings by Austrian artist Egon Schiel can also be seen. These paintings are reclining female nude with legs spread apart from 1914, crouching nude back view from 1917, and female nude lying on stomach from 1917. Some may interpret these as a peek into the perverse thoughts of the Driller Killer. However, as we're playing the game from Megan's perspective, it seems more logical to deduce that she's the one thinking about these artworks. Whether she studied art history or simply saw the drawings in a book, documentary or gallery somewhere, perhaps her brain projected these artworks at random, since there seems to be nothing connecting the drawings with the current context. From a meta point of view, Scheel was considered controversial during his lifetime for his art's focus on nudity and sexuality, while also having a problematic history with adultery, incest and exploitation of underage models. He died relatively young at age 28 from the Spanish flu, and all this context plus his raw, somewhat distorted art style are not out of place in setting up a disturbing atmosphere for a horror story. Lastly, the hallway scene itself. From what we can gather by exploring the outside of the warehouse, the hallway far exceeds the length of the building itself, and if it was meant to be located underground, it would still protrude out the side of the mountain. Scaling issues aside, the lighting and the child illusion heavily imply that nothing is as it seems. As a result, I believe that the hallway length is greatly exaggerated for thematic purposes, whether or not it's to reflect Megan's emotions or brain damage. In terms of where the hallway leads to, I suspect that it leads to the back door, which is said to be sealed shut when inspected. After passing the Driller Killer and at some point during the prolonged hallucination of the hallway changing colour and level of finer detail, it's possible that she broke through the exit without realising it, as a result of her TBI affecting her perception of the world around her. I speculate that it happened at this point, where the floor and ceiling turns black for several metres before replicating the previous pattern of the hallway. This could represent the brief lapse between Megan exiting the building and the hallucination taking full effect and projecting her paranoid disbelief that she made it out. Whether her brain specifically caused red and white to overlay her vision to reflect her emotions, or the colouring was simply coincidental. From a meta perspective, the symbolism still conveys a similar message. 
Red represents violence and danger, while white represents peace and safety. So, what happens after she reaches the literal light at the end of the tunnel? This is where PDM's arcade remake and the future full version come into play. What we do know is that the full version will include a Jeff campaign, meaning that we will most likely get more context for him and Megan's relationship, as well as the lead up to their accident and what caused it. I don't see Jeff's campaign taking place after the crash, since he was so injured he couldn't get out of the car and became unresponsive before Megan even left his side. Apart from this, we can only speculate as to what Poppet Combo has in store for the full game. For now, here are my guesstimates. The arcade version shows Megan escaping the warehouse and fleeing to a ute which she uses to drive away from her assailant, before text indicates that she will recover in a crisis center. Since we see a car parked outside the warehouse, not to mention the Brandon sawmill was once host to many workers who presumably had to travel quite far to get there. The arcade version's ending could actually be applicable. An article inside the warehouse states that over a dozen people have gone missing over a 100 mile stretch of the Pocono Mountains. So it's possible that the driller killer used a vehicle to transport unconscious campers to his lair, whether his own or that of his victims. Especially since he's known to have abducted multiple people at a time on at least one occasion. Therefore, it's likely that Megan had a few options for a getaway ride. The arcade version shows the Ute being right outside the warehouse, but in the full game, the potential getaway rides could be scattered far and wide across the wilderness and in varying conditions. Some might be bogged in thick mud, others could be rusted from overexposure to elements, or have had their tires punctured by the rocky terrain or simply be out of fuel. These plot convenient yet realistic setbacks could help build the framework for a fully fledged survival horror game. Considering this and the gameplay touched on by PDM's prequel, Nightwatch, the full version could follow Megan as she navigates the wilderness trying to find campers and or an escape vehicle, all while the driller killer stalks her and anyone she comes across putting the massacre in Power Drill Massacre, you could say. This would open up a whole new array of challenges for players and character development for both Megan and the Driller Killer, as well as provide an opportunity to further tie PDM with its prequel by featuring Nightwatch's Park Ranger Tower and surrounding landmarks. With this game having been set in 1978, nine years prior to PDM, perhaps one of Jim's children has grown up and become the next park ranger in order to get answers about their father's disappearance. This would also give us the chance to see the true extent of Megan's injuries as a result of the car crash and the driller killer's attacks. Like the arcade version's ending, the full version could end with her recovering in a crisis center with them providing support for rehabilitation for her TBI, other injuries, and her emotional trauma. It's unclear if Puppet Combo intends to make this a major story element, but it's fun to ponder about all the same. It'd be so refreshing to see them explore how a car crash survivor with a TBI manages her injuries while dealing with all the typical slasher horror shenanigans she faces. In the end, I guess time and Puppet Combo will tell when the full game will come out. And then we can settle once and for all whether it was Megan or her attacker who, well, screwed up. Thank you all so much for watching. It's been such a long time since I've done a video essay and I've missed it so, so much. Writing is a huge passion of mine and I want to do more of these projects in the future. If you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed making it, please leave a like and comment below. You can also donate at my Ko-fi page, which is linked in the pinned comment. References can be found in the description. And lastly, please remember that this is all in good fun and not to be taken too seriously. The full version of the game could completely debunk this video and that's fine. Once again, I'm not a medical expert, and while Megan loosely exhibits signs and symptoms of a TBI from a narrative standpoint, 
I absolutely do not claim that this accurately represents the nature of TVIs in real life. This video was made in the spirit of initiating discussion about this notorious game. I might do a follow-up video once the full version comes out to discuss what I got right and wrong. But in the meantime, you know the drill. Take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you all later. Bye!